On August 17, 2011, I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ on the day that my youngest daughter was born. And I remember distinctly looking around and knowing that I was born again, knowing that my life would never be the same. And I just, I asked God, I just said, now what? And in his still small voice, he said these words, share this. And that's what I'm aiming to do with this film. What you're about to watch, we're calling a trust the guide film. Billy Moles has one testimony. I've got a, a still going through my walk with the Lord, but I've found that I have the opportunity to share the testimony of other hunters, other fishermen, other outdoorsmen, to share that with the world, and I feel obligated and honored and privileged to do that, and that's what you're about to watch here. For a long time, I've prided myself on being able to work, support my family, and do ministry as well, and never ask anybody for money. And I'm still, I guess, clinging to that, but I feel as though the Lord is, I am starting to see my own pride in that. And as I'm seeking to surrender to the Lord's will, and that is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ through the lens of hunting, this is something that I feel that he is leading me to do. So that said, we are going to share this film on YouTube, no commercials, no nothing, just to get it out there to as many people as possible. If that is something that you personally would like to support, you can find a link to support this ministry uh, in the description below. If not, if you want to just share this video, whatever the case may be, uh, we're, we're happy to share this with you. And lastly, if you're an outfitter and you're interested in highlighting your business and perhaps you're looking for an opportunity to share your testimony, to leave a legacy for, for your family, for those that you know, and an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, Trust the Guide, I believe, is a platform that I want to give others in the outdoors that feel they, they don't know how to share their faith, but they want to do that. I want to open that door of opportunity to, to others. I, I believe this is what the Lord has called me to do, to, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ through hunting. And I've got one voice, but I know that there's a lot of voices out there, whether you're a alligator hunter in Florida or a deer hunter in, in the Midwest or a, uh, a grizzly bear outfitter in Alaska. We've all got a story and a testimony that is gonna connect with other people's lives and touch other people in ways that I'm, I can't. And I feel blessed I know every time that I'm with someone and I spend intimate time with them for, for days, perhaps weeks, and get to know somebody on such a personal level, everybody has a story and everybody has a ministry and Trust the Guide is all about giving other people opportunities to minister in ways in which by themselves they maybe can't or don't know how to do. So if this is something that interests you, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to chat with you about it. And again, I appreciate your support and I hope you enjoy this film.
I'm, I'm the hero. I'm the protectionist. I'm the one that's supposed to protect my wife. But no. If anybody knows anything about anemia, the very first signs of anemia is chewing ice. So for a year, my wife chewed ice to annoy me when in fact she was chewing ice because she was dying. <laughs> Good enough for the girls we go out with. <laughs> Looks like a pretty sweet redneck rig, 200,000 miles. All right, so I think it's right, then right, then a left. When in doubt, probably go downhill, and I think we'll get there. What could go wrong? Flew into Sacramento last night. Brian's wife, Celeste, picked us up 9 p.m., got here at 1.30 in the morning, and that which was 3.30 in the morning our time. So, a little bit of jet lag today. Hung out with the Kinsey family this morning. Got to chat with Brian a little bit. I'm really excited for the next few days that we get to spend with him and his family and now we are headed into I don't even know what town we're going to somewhere near Redding California I have never spoken at a fitness center believe it or not but that's where we're headed so we'll see what happens but I was here a uh, year and a half ago met some awesome people so I'm, I'm excited for this one I want to roll the rope over to the other side of the spoke. There, hold it. And then when you're doing it, just keeping your hand, you're just kind of keeping your hand above your head. Flat. Sounds easy. <laughs> We're going to get ready to get started, and uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of bring us all together and uh, have Zach open for us in prayer. If everybody will kind of huddle around a little bit. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your love that binds us all together. We thank you for your forgiveness, your healing. Lord, we ask that hearts would be open to you. Lord, we ask that your light would shine in each one of us. We ask that what we do and say would be honoring to you and point to you. For without you, we've got nothing. And we just thank you for your redemption in your Son, Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Thank you, Zach. When I spoke at the Kinsey event the year before, I could see that there was a unique dynamic in the family and Brian was clearly the leader. And not that he ever made it seem as such, but that everybody just naturally wanted to follow him. And you could see that he was the patriarch of his family. Because not only did his kids respect him, but every single one of his daughters and sons-in-law they all called him dad. And I'm in a season in family, business, and I would say God's calling on my life where I'm being placed more into leadership roles. And if I'm being honest, I realize I suck at it. But Brian's leadership was so evident and it was so powerful that I knew that there had to be a story there. And I knew that Jesus had to be at the root of his leadership. 
For 40 years of my life, my singular focus has been to reap, has been to get something for myself, to concern myself with all the things that I wanted to do, the places that I wanted to go. And I'm like, what if I just spent, Lord willing, the second half of my life seeking to sow? Because I realized I was in Africa without even really trying. I was reaping in Africa because I sowed in Alaska. Because if we're focused on ourselves, that's right where Satan wants us. Because there is no light in that. We're not gonna give any life or be able to inspire any other people when we're focused on ourselves. I've hunted all over the world. And had done every dream, everything that I've ever imagined in my life has come true and I've, I'm certain of this. There is no greater adventure in this life than following Jesus Christ. God bless you all. I sit there and I dwell and I think about things in life and in my walk. I've been walking with God uh, since I was 21, um, before my first child, the Celeste, was born. And uh, one of the things that I teach my kids or one of the sayings I have, or a couple of them, one is the text I sent you is one of the greatest, humility is one of the greatest gifts from God. Nobody likes that. Nobody wants to hear that, and nobody wants humility. But it is one of the greatest gifts from God. When you get humiliated in a hunt, you gain so much wisdom. Uh, you, you gain thanks, you know. Once you get over your ego and your frustration and, you know, you're blaming, and I do this all the time when my kids will come to me, especially when they're younger about stuff, I'll say, well, what happened and who did this and what could you have done differently? And they start deflecting. I just go, I look at them and I go, are you doing this right now? You know, take the humility. That's the great, one of the greatest gifts from God. The other thing is that I say all the time to people and is pain is wisdom, you know, and that's another gift from God. It's not too different from, from, uh, um, humility, take the pain. Doesn't matter what kind of pain it is. Physical pain, mental pain, um, you know, run with that and you'll, you'll gain and learn so much more. Because the other thing is, hurt is anger and anger is hurt. If you really analyze those two words and those two emotions, it is the exact same thing. Generally with you know, if you analyze it every time you got angry, you know, your emotions somehow got hurt. Your guy cut you off, right? So you, can, <laughs> you want to get up and jump on him and pounce him. And what really it was hurt, your ego got hurt, you know? Um, so I said, tell me that you're hurt, not that you're angry. And, and that's okay. It's not okay to be angry. Hurt is anger. So I, that's the other thing I always tell the kids is, Anger is hurt, hurt is anger, but go with hurt. It's easier to process, easier to deal with. And men can't, we struggle with it, right? You're not hurt, you know? Don't show that hurt, don't get up, don't cry. But I try to get all, all my boys to realize that, again, hurt, dealing with hurt is a strength, and admitting hurt is a strength. So. We're actually pre-scouting for uh... Billy and Jeremiah tomorrow. We're gonna see if uh, 
if we're seeing any turkey activity, signs, tracks, anything like that up here right now. We're in uh, northeastern California, great turkey hunting. And uh, on a side note, it's really tough to do an interview when your client's over there with the thick hanging out. You're giving me a lot of credit to say that it's hanging. <laughs> Pretty cold out here. There's actually right where we turned left right down here. There's a meadow to the right that's protected. Um, that you're not supposed to remove any any artifacts from there. Do you believe that? Is that a, is that a guide guide fable? He's telling us that these are chips from making arrowheads. There's some busy Indians. <laughs> Just the right size. <laughs> oh man, this is neat. Yeah, everybody says, oh Billy, you gotta be used to the rain. I said, nope, I don't do anything in the rain unless I'm getting paid for it. It's a late spring, cold, windy. Went out a couple mile hike here. Saw a few old tracks, nothing fresh, but Brian and Nathaniel are going to take us out tomorrow. They said this is a spot where they've always done well in years past. So a lot of country to hunt. And uh, I just like, for me, whether I shoot a turkey or not, don't really care. Um, I just like being out in the mountains. Being in a place where you can see snow-capped mountains in the background. Big, expansive, lonely country. Just being out in the middle of nowhere. That's, that's what I love. And uh, maybe do a little fishing tomorrow. Nature is not a chain, nature is a spider web. As humans, our ecosystem, each and every one of us, is a strand in a web. We're all connected. We all have a unique purpose. And the purpose of everything in nature is to live its life, to give life to another organism. And that's what our purpose is. If you want something new to come alive, if you want to make a change in your life, something old has to die. So often in life, you know, we see people, they, they get to some elevated position or they have something that looks pretty attractive. You think, wow, must be nice. They don't see what it took to get there. The greatest blessing, perhaps, that I had, two things. My parents taught me how to work and I was hungry. Name is Brian Kinsey the second, and uh, I live up in northeastern California, a little town called Oak Run, California. I am a guide and previous owner of uh, www.kinseyguideservice, who I've now given to my son Nathaniel Kinsey. I am still a licensed and bonded guide here in California, and I'm a licensed and bonded guide in Alaska. I am a fishing guide in Alaska, just to be clear, um, and uh, been doing it now for quite a while, <laughs> a long time, and uh, probably will just be doing it just for a couple more years, and, and that's why I gave the business to my son, and I'm just trying to slowly uh, retire and, and watch the business grow through my kids. I was born in Northern California, Northeastern California, kind of near and below the Yosemite area. A lot of folks don't know that that my dad that raised me was, was not my biological dad. Um, my mom divorced uh, my, my biological father um, for very deep-rooted personal reasons. Um, uh, 
my there was my two sisters and me I was the middle and uh, we were um, at least myself and my my older sister was abused pretty bad what was incredible is that my mom left him and met who I call my dad at about age six age seven and he was such a good man and and a big outdoorsman big outdoors and big hunter fishery was up you know northeastern east of sonora yosemite people that know northern california know that's beautiful remote mountains and immediately when he took me under his wing it was hunting and fishing that's pretty much all we did sports hunting and fishing sports hunting and fishing and uh he was also uh, um just a coach not just a dad but you know he's my baseball coach he was um my mentor he was just a phenomenal guy and you know just his laugh was infectious would never get any game because it seems like everything in the woods was just fun it was all about fun it wasn't about killing anything it wasn't about harvesting it was just about uh, being in the woods with his family, with his boys, just having fun. We camped a ton, we fished a ton. It was really big. I went through my childhood um, without God. And uh, so through, you know, moving on with my, my dad and hunting and fishing, I mean, literally like if we weren't in sports, We'd wait, you know, and then hunting season would come. We would be, you know, hunting and fishing. And uh, so there was still something empty in me. <clears throat> I still had an emptiness, um, literally all through high school. So going through my childhood and my teen years and all that, I just remember just being angry and didn't like people too much. That's I think that's why I excelled in sports too. I was a '90s baseball thrower. I got you know, thrown over 90 miles an hour, and because I just wanted to shut everybody down, you know, I wanted to I wanted to beat everybody. The phoniness, the you know, the braggarts, you know, the bullies, everything. So I kind of. I think I coined a phrase early on in life where I was going to make sure I was the bully's bully. So anytime I saw a a bully, um, I always wanted to thump him. And, uh, and most of the time I did if I saw it happen. Now, I don't want to sound like a braggart myself because all through high school, I was definitely not a perfect guy. I didn't have God in my life, um, made a lot of mistakes. Uh, acted like an idiot a lot, did a lot of stupid things. And I remember thinking that all I want in life is a family. That's all I want. I mean, I just, I, I just wanted kids so bad. I, I wanted a wife so bad. I was very specific in my wants. I wanted a, a Hispanic girl. I thought Hispanic girls were beautiful. I wanted those beautiful brown eyes. I've always called me and my boys protectionists. We always just want to protect the underdog, the child. And, you know, that age before they're 10, 12 years old, you know, before society kind of ruins them. And so as I was going through school, actually one of my dreams was also to be, because it was, it was really big back then, back in those days, it was just kind of starting out in the late 60s was, uh, you know serial killers and you know child abductors and all that so my life my first goal ever in life was to work federal and track down uh, people that harm children and uh, we didn't go that direction but i was still kind of headed into law enforcement but i was still with my dad constantly hunting and fishing and constantly in sports which he kept me so wrapped up in all these things, it, it helped keep the noise away. My, my anger, I guess that's the best way to describe it as I was growing up was anger. Later on, I learned to call it hurt, but um, I was very angry and never thought that, that I'd ever have a family, never thought that I'd ever have a kid. And, and, uh, and so all through school, this all went on. And then 
at about age 15, 16, um, this, uh, this family came to visit their family from Texas. I had a pretty good body physique back then. I was thin, I was in shape. So I, I remember I, my, I think I made some excuse to my dad that I was gonna go out and wax his, polish his boat. And I go out there and I just start polishing the boat and they're out sitting on, sitting down the road, um, watching me. Do, and I'm doing the old, <sighs> you know, just, just trying to make myself look good. And that was probably um, some of the best hunting I ever did. I mean, I was, I was calling, calling her in. And, uh, and all of a sudden, this absolute beautiful woman shows up, but she was young, she was young. She was 18 or 19. And uh, I was 15, just turning 16. And then she opened her mouth and she had this, this uh, Southern draw from Texas. Something like, hey, uh, what you doing? What's your name? You know, and I'm like, I almost just fell out of the boat. I'm Celeste Kinsey. I grew up in Las Passes, Texas. So my mom was Dolores Emanuel Torres. There were six children. We grew up in this small town and very poor. Um, my dad, through the years and everything, he was an alcoholic. And my dad used to work hard. He would work for a gentleman, Mr. Bear, and my mom, was a stay-at-home mom, took care of kids. My dad would work and he'd come home. Mr. Bear would give him money and if so, the money would get spent on alcohol and never make it home. So my mom did talk to Mr. Bear. He gave him animals instead. And my mom, sometimes when we did get money and stuff like this, she tried to provide for us the well, best way she could. So she would go to the store and everything and she would budget shop and everything. And I remember we would go to <laughs> H-E-B, because that's the grocery store that was there. And my mom would go to the uh, the canned meat section and there was a can of potted meat. And my mom used to tell us as kids that this was rich people food. So we thought we were eating rich people food, you know, but, and indeed we were very, very poor. When my husband and I were married, we went to, and we lived in the Bay Area, San Jose, and we went to the grocery store and it was Lucky's grocery store and we were going down the aisle and my husband, uh, I said, oh, babe, look, look. And it was three cans of potted meat for a dollar. And I said, look, this is rich people food. <laughs> and I just started grabbing some and putting the shopping cart. And my husband looked at me and he gave me this look and he said, no, Celeste, this is poor people food. And he started taking it out of the shopping cart and putting it back. And I said, no, I was brought up, this is rich people food, put it back and forth. It wasn't till then, as you grow up, that you look back at your childhood and sometimes you realize that you were blessed. I mean, I thought potted meat was rich people food, but it was food to us. And God provided, but it was <laughs> potted meat. And I look back and well, my husband and I now we're doing better. I'm not, but I mean, we're doing good now compared to what I think of my childhood and being brought up. But I am allowed one can of potted meat in the house. So uh, I graduated May 28th in 1980. And uh, uh, it was a real, you know, supposed to be a very exciting day. And I remember, I'll never forget it. Um, my mom ended up pulling my dad into the living room and I'm ready to go to graduation. And my dad had been drinking and my mom sat the older kids down, Manuel, me, Danita and me, and we were the older batch of kids. And my mom told my dad he had to make a decision in his life and she said and you people know with an alcoholic you can't ask an alcoholic a question when they've been drinking and he was already drinking and my mom asked him the question um, family or alcohol and he chose alcohol and so here on my graduation day and everything didn't think much about it and everything went in to my graduation my mom and dad were there and the next day my mom had us all pack up what we could fit in a suitcase 
just, you know, our own, whatever you could fit in a suitcase, every kid. And we left my dad and my mom took us to California where we stayed with her sister. This went on for like, I want to say, I think my mom and dad were separated for like seven years or whatever. But anyway, they eventually got back together. But um, I will never forget that because it devastated me that about that happening. But at the same time, I look at it as a blessing because if my mom would not have left my dad for him to hit rock bottom and get to that position where he got to where he made a choice himself, you know, he eventually wanted family, not the alcohol. If she would have never made that decision, I would have never met my husband. And so it's kind of like that, that song, I think it's Garth Brooks, unanswered prayers you don't know, but it was a blessing because if we would have stayed in Lampasas, I probably would have never met my husband now and have the family that I have today. But with my mom making that decision and going to California, I literally met the young man next door, married the neighbor next door, and I am blessed to have what I have today. I find out later that it was her sister giving her a dare to go talk to me and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, we ended up starting talking and got closer and closer together and, and uh, we're together probably, I don't know, year, year and a half. I was in high school when I got her pregnant and, uh, and I'm pretty sure that my, some of my family and some of her family, we know they were kind of disappointed, maybe angry. Um, as we were going, going forward and Celeste is pregnant, my dad said, you're not going to school, you're going to work and, uh, you're, you're having a child and, uh, you're going to support that child and you're going to marry that girl. And there was no doubt I was going to marry that girl. I, I wanted to marry that girl. I wanted to marry that girl more than sports, more than anything else. I, I wanted her to, I wanted her for the rest of my life, the day I saw her. And uh, so I went to work, so I, I graduate. Um, I let a lot of people down and uh, I didn't care. My, my, you know, I was getting what I want. I got this beautiful girl and her and I decided alone. I know if I would have asked her right then, she would have married me in a heartbeat. But then all of a sudden I start getting this re these religious views, you know, from all walks of religion. Oh, you know, she's knocked up. You better marry her before, um, you know, you have that baby. Um, that's a sin, da 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 da. And I knew nothing about sin. I don't know. It was just, again, it was more noise, more emptiness. And her and I talked about it and I said, hey, I love you and I want to marry you, but I'm hearing all this noise and I want to make sure that we marry each other for the right reason, not because I got you pregnant. And I didn't understand Bible. I didn't understand bi biblical consequences. I didn't understand anything other than nobody is going to force me to do anything and or her. And then I'm just going to protect her. I'm going to protect us. We had the baby and it was Cassandra. Just absolutely the best thing that ever happened in my life. Probably the second best. Celeste, then Cassandra. So with them both. I mean, those two things, I was already, life was good right there. Be, be strong, pop, pop, and courageous. God is with you wherever you go. Be strong. I love you guys. I love you. Bye. Like my dad, he 
can't talk to him and he can't hear anything you're saying, but I swear that dude can hear turkey spitting drum from a mile away. We'll be walking, he'll be like, there's one around the corner. I'm like, what? But yeah, you'll hear it, especially when he gets closer. turkey hunt definitely not a turkey shoot it was fun though learned a lot different style of hunting here in this timber you know you're kind of more on the move Midwest I'm used to hunting fields setting up decoys and yeah you do some running gunning a little bit but this is much bigger country so we're gonna have one of the best lunches there is not as good as shore lunch not as good as sheep ribs in an open fire, but tailgate lunches are always pretty sweet. Get those are Alaskan organic ones. Just a little farther north than where little Bri was packing. I, I think I should just shut up. I try to help. A lot of times, like, a, a, there's no dumb questions, only dumb people that ask them, right? So, I don't know. It's kind of a different story. Usually, I'm the one. I want to help. But I'm not sure. There's a fine line between helping and getting in the way, I reckon. We are going to float the river, the Sacramento, and hopefully get uh, some rainbows, maybe some steelhead. And we're supposed to get a little bit of rain, but right now it's a beautiful day, a little windy maybe, but I'm looking forward to this. This will be pretty fun. We're going right, basically right through the heart of Redding, California. And uh, it's a beautiful river for being in a city. So I'm looking forward to it. I haven't been fly fishing in years, several years. So yeah, it's kind of kind of amazing how little hunting and fishing I've done in the past 10 years. So I'm looking forward to it. Kind of use your leg locks if you want. There you go. Yeah. 
really take off, keep your let them out. Come down to the left, down, down, see how I'm turning for you. Let's stay right there for a minute. She's actually really cooperating. Let me have some, let me go, let me go. Let me have oh, let me well, go. I suppose he's got current. Yeah. yeah. Pretty by the saw the boat. Nope, let me have it. Let me go, let me go. More down to the left. Yeah, he is. More down to the left. Put that rod down. No, let, me go. let me go. Let all that go. So hand off. All the line. Yep. Yep. Drag that where you want it. Yep. Yep. So now when I go out, I'm either start stripping or reeling, whatever you're more comfortable doing. Hang on. That's a bigger fish than I thought. I yeah. thought it was like a little. Pull, pull a little bit of line out though for a sec. Not, yeah. Mend it or get on the reel? No, you're getting just slow though. Don't. Let me get down on him. We need him to go back in the water. There you go, that's better. Now start reeling. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Smooth though. You're on he's on the little fly. Smooth. Okay, that's good. Let's go back down again. Yep, go ahead and start reeling again. Good, good. Put that rod down and let move more. Even if you want it high, point down to the left. Up in trout, don't hold that reel. Yeah. Okay, so those bend, we got a little, little fly. Either we service them, get straight tension to that fish. A lot of times you lose them, don't keep it down. I'm trying to get around them. Now you can kind of angle it up a little. Good. Keep reeling slow. And then this is where you really slow it down, right? Like pulling the trigger. Slow. Slow. Towards me now, so that's right here. It's everything like statue of Right over your head. Yep. Slow statue of liberty. Keep going. Keep going. Lift a little harder. Okay. Do it again. Keep lifting. Keep lifting. Right now. Keep going. Keep going. Above your head. Nice. He's a pro, Brack. Hold this right there. I told him, I said, man, this is a tough, tough spot to land him in the chute right here. Keep him in the water. And I know with this guy, I'm going to get a good photo. <laughs> Preaching it. Let her rip, brother. A few years back, I got drawn for a muzzleloader hunt, and it took me 13 years to draw. And, and I had a lot of expectations going into it. Um, as I'm waiting for it, a fire broke out in that area, and I did not have a good attitude about this fire that was burning in my zone that I drew because I just figured it was going to ruin my opportunities, and maybe it was just going to get wasn't it was going to ruin it. So I was cussing and not really having that good of an attitude about it. Anyways, fire goes out, able to get off work, go hunt. And I spend the next eight days putting my time in and grinding looking for this, this animal. And the conditions weren't good. I just, my attitude really sucked. I mean, I, I just, I was happy to be out on this hunt, but my expectations of waiting 13 years for this tag and then the weather and everything wasn't the way it was going in my book. And I just found out I was making myself more miserable and not really enjoying just the day and what happened. And I found one good buck, tried to get on it day after day in this burn, couldn't find it again. And I kept going to this burn and sitting there, real cold, 15 degrees in the morning, which is pretty cold for October around here. Just sitting there in the cold and finally the sun came up and it just illuminated all this new growth. And I just kind of got a tear in my eye and I just started to go, Lord, you're here. I said, this is where you want me, regardless of if I get anything or not. I'm like, he, he brought me here to see that where fire's been, it's actually new growth. And speed it, speed the story up, I end up shooting that buck with his dad finally came up, we hunted it, shot him in the burn that I had a bad attitude about because it had the freshest newest growth and this buck was hanging out with these does 
It wasn't as big as the buck as I was in my mind wanted. The three by four was a decent buck. But I thought, you know, God, that's, that's seven points. Four on one side, three on the other, seven. You wanted me to come to the grips that with the burns in your life, the hard times, it's where the new growth's at. That's where he wants us at. And I just applied it to my life as a fireman and all the hard things in my life. God wants us to go back and feed on the new growth and be content sitting there in your burn. So. And what happens we go, when we go back to the old growth, we get burned. So part if, if, in, in the fire world, if, if, you're, if you're fighting fire, the safest place to be is where fire has already been. If you're, if you're, if fire's approaching you, you need to be in the black or in an area where it's already burnt. So in a spiritual sense, if you're running into the old growth where it felt comfortable, fire's gonna overtake you and you're not gonna survive. So you need to go where the burn's at in your life. Go to God and wait for his son and water to start that growth. But we gotta be content in the wait and he'll bring it to you. Love it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so what's the greatest thing your daddy ever taught you, little Bri? You're his namesake comes with a little bit of the greatest thing he ever what taught you my dad's always been big soft in your heart yeah either 24 hours cooling off time because <laughs> anyone knows us <laughs> kinsies we got a little bit of a temper the first no. first <laughs> we get worked up my dad's like hey before you do anything or say anything give yourself 24 hours cooling off time so that's one or uh if it's something you know that's that really affects us and makes us, you know, it, it more hurts you and you hurt his anger and frustration, all that stuff. It's, he says, soften your heart, you know what I mean? And those are probably the two things that I'll remember my dad cook. Give yourself 24 hours cooling off time or if you need to soften your heart right now. Those are the two best things that I can think of that my dad said to me. For true on our loves on you Oh, guys that's iron. a great one. Yeah, Let me see it. it. Let's see, I don't think I got it out of your dad. I had seen it on him, but yeah. I don't think I filmed yeah. it yet. What's the meaning behind that? Yeah, for true love, it's it's when you get in trouble or you do something, it doesn't matter what it is, our family will stop and say for true love, like, hey, are you gonna are you gonna be there to pick up the kids today at 5:30 or whatever? And you're like, yeah, 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 and it's like for true honor love, you're gonna pick them up, right? Or it gets so silly, our family like somebody will eat the last steak on the table, and we're like, who ate that? Nobody admits to it. Mom goes around for true love, you didn't eat it. We're trying to love you, didn't it? And you can't lie on it. You lie on it. Ain't nobody talking to you the rest of the night or probably the week, sometimes a month. Like you get caught lying on we're to love, you better stay away. And uh, and I think 90%, everyone that's of age has the tattoo for Troll and our love. And we don't lie on it. So that's the family credo. Yeah. Yep. That's a great one. Any words of wisdom for us? Yeah, it's about to get real. boys and girls I think the storm missed us you know why the reason why is because we have Billy Moles with us blessed so blessed 
Not even Chuck Norris can have storms move out of the way for him like Billy does. That's why. <laughs> You're too much sometimes. <laughs> What's the uh, best piece of advice, Nathaniel, that your dad's ever given you? Uh -huh. Figure it out before asking for help, or try to figure it out before asking for help. Um, he's always raised us to be pretty independent. I remember being little and working on vehicles, um, stuff like that, and I'd be stumped. and. I'd be like, hey, I need your help. He's like, well, what you try? And I'm like, no, I just don't even know where to start. And he's like, go figure it out. Then if you can't, then we'll, uh, I'll come out and help you. He'd always tell us, act if I was dead. <laughs> My version of outdoors before I met him was going to a camping trip once a year. That was it. And so now, like, I find joy in going out in the woods and just walking and hiking and you know, my favorite thing to do with Big Brian or Dad is uh, to go, you know, track bears because he just gets so fired up about it. So it gets me all fired up. But that's kind of why I look at him as a father figure and I call him Dad is because he's shown me like how to love the outdoors and how really to appreciate the mountains. And, you know, it's a lot more peaceful up there than it is down here. On a scale of one to ten, my dad is. probably like a 9.5 <laughs> there's always room for improvement he taught us that <laughs> thing about thing about brian is that uh i mean he's very open with uh i mean his emotions obviously and his beliefs um his leadership his kindness um he will help anybody like the neighbors, the someone driving down the road. Um, and I think we've all learned that from him too. So it's like, we see someone stopped on the side of the road, we're stopping. And I don't think that happens nowadays. You know, it's like, um, we'll be at Costco and you'll see like a old lady trying to put her groceries in the car. And any one of my brothers, my dad, my husband, they'll any one of them will stop and walk straight over and start help you know do you need help let me help you get your groceries in and you just don't see that kindness now and i think that my dad has just raised us and instilled that in us and he's an open book you know it's uh he doesn't he doesn't really hold anything back and he's going to give you the truth whether you whether you like it or it's gonna you're not gonna like it um but it, there's value to that just his understanding and acceptance like he shows us grace with everything but there's also some very very uh important conversations that we've had because in my working career i've been i've worked a lot of a lot of jobs you know and, and been through a lot of different situations and i started opening up and talking to him about it and he'd say well what about this you know what you gotta you gotta think like this you know, and as far as leadership goes. And so I started implement, implementing that to my work life and it grew. So then I would end up in these supervisor positions then I would end up in these managerial positions, you know, and it was, I could see that what I was putting into work, those different, uh, you know, principles and, and things that he's telling me to just, just try it. And I would do it, and I could see the I could see the progress, and I could see how they uh, affect everybody, how they worked. And, and don't get me wrong, it wasn't like one day we talked about this, and the next day it was everything was great. Uh, that's not how it works. You know, you have to implement it, and you have to believe it, and you have to just keep doing it over and over and over again. Um, and it was frustrating at times, um, not only professionally but uh, personally uh, with my family that I had those battles inside that we're like okay well i'm doing it but it's not showing you know but um it was the fact that you just persevere and you keep doing it and i see you know in in his kids and what he does in his life and where he's at and the and the peace and the happiness that he has is what really um really what made me hang on to it because 
I struggled with that for a long time and it's just I always had some conflict within myself or in my life you know and we would always talk about it and he would say give it to God you know you got to trust that and then but if you don't do that you'll never have that peace so those so those uh, that advice and those life skills that he gave me and that guidance you know I'm still going through my my uh, you know my walk with with God and Jesus right now um, and it's very recent um, and it's been tough it has its struggles but I feel very good about it and because of that man you know I call him dad for sure um, because of every, he's op- he's accepted me with open arms and he's I mean he does that with everybody you know once you're you know a friend of the family you're basically one of his kids or you know might as well be family no matter what um, so I held that very close uh, to myself and and uh, and call him dad because of that because he's guided me through so many uh, different journeys at the same time you know and so I'm just grateful for that sometimes it takes a loss to for you to find yourself I mean I always believe myself as a Christian it wasn't until the loss of my son in 2000 and he lost his dad in 2000 he was already a saved Christian but in 2000 when I lost my son I was at my lowest and that's the year I was saved Celeste basically left home, ran away from home to be with me. So she left her family, and they all ended up going back to Texas. So she's here alone and, uh, you know, and get willing to make a life with me, sacrifice her whole life for me. And uh, so now I'm a failure because, you know, I failed the people that wanted me to go pro. I... I'm now failing my, my girlfriend and my child because I can't pay bills and I can't do nothing. So then I'm thinking, I need to go party. I just need to get away and go party and, you know, figure out ways to find, you know, find peace, you know, through alcohol or whatever. I was, I was never a drug guy, so never tested any of that. And uh, it's more, you know, go have some beers and go party with my buddies and I'm looking for my buddies to find my buddies and they're nowhere to be found. And I'm like, then all of a sudden I'd see them somewhere a few days later, you know, three, four or five of them, just stud, stud dudes. And I would like, Hey, let's go party or whatever. They're, they're like, no, we don't, we don't do that. Like, what do you mean? You don't do that. You know, and we'd love to hang out, but you know, we're, we're into something a little different in life. And I'm like, okay, see you then I look for somebody to party with you know to you know try to find me some peace and so I'm not thinking so much and get rid of the noise a couple days later I'd see him again a couple days later I'd see again fast forward I'd see him again and every time they saw me they didn't avoid me or anything they always come up to me how you doing man we miss you yeah we miss the good old days too and sports and all that kind of stuff but yeah we don't we don't drink anymore we don't party anymore any of that well what are you guys doing and uh, cause I need, I'm like, I need a little of what you got. <laughs> and they got, well, we got Jesus. And I'm like, what do you mean you got Jesus? And immediately, you know, I'm, I wanted to make fun of them or whatever. Like, what do you mean you got Jesus? Quit, quit playing. And they're like, no, we're serious. That's what we got, Brian. We got Jesus and you need Jesus. And if you had Jesus, you would have some of what we got. If you want what we have, you need to go to, uh, what was it? Spring Valley. I think it was Spring Valley Bible Church in Milpitas, California with Pastor Mills. I'm like, okay, nice chatting with you. You know, and I reject it. Contemplated suicide a lot all through from all through high school. There probably was not a day that didn't go by that I didn't contemplate suicide. And then I saw my buddies again and, uh, Brian, how you doing? Same piece. I'm like, I got to have what you have. Well, come on, let's just go try it. And that was the turning point in my life because they took me to this church and I listened to the service. Didn't understand it much, but I could see all the people. You could feel something in this church. Like, ooh, what is that? I like that. 
what is going on? What is that feeling we got going in here? Strangers coming up to me and hugging me and, you know, how are you doing, Brian? People I didn't know saying my name. We heard, we heard months ago that you would be here. That was the first time. The first time that I felt undeserved love. I broke down then, but I'm breaking down now. I think I swore in church. I think I said, it is real or something like that and I was like oh I'm sorry and they all start laughing they go you don't have to be sorry Celeste knew um, you know that I had given my life to Christ and uh, she saw a transformation in me that she could not believe and was kind of shocked by it and uh, and then all of a sudden I didn't have a, a worry in the world bottom line because I think the peace and the changes that it made in me all of a sudden, Celeste then wanted that peace, and she dedicated her life to Christ. At, I remember the day at the services, my daughter, Crystal, she was saved at the funeral. And when I was told she was saved, I thought, you know, God knows what he's doing. He took my son, and I know my son's going to be in heaven, but now I know that someday he saved my other child, and I know I'll see her. And all my children have been saved now. And I know someday when I go, my son will be waiting for me at those gates. And I know that someday I will see all my children because they've been saved. And my husband. <laughs> so that's what I love about my husband. He's very strong-willed and hardworking. And his faith is strong. And he made me or brought me around to where I should be as a saved Christian. Like Celeste, I got to... I got to get up to the mountains. I got to get back to the mountains. We moved up here. My my mom and dad, my aunts and uncles all bought uh, like hobby ranch size homes up here. Some a little bigger. They all moved up here. Um, but my mom and dad's place was available because they were still working. They hadn't retired yet. So we were able to live in their place while I was working. And so then I decided to go back to school, get my criminal justice degree, and uh, become a game warden. That's what I wanted, because it made sense. I love the mountains so much, I want to be in the mountains my entire life. I want to hunt my entire life. And what better thing to do than to hunt people, right? So I can hunt people for my job. I, I wasn't big on criminals anyway. So, so while we were up here, I was contacted by a company that was relatively new. Matter of fact, it was brand new in the area. And uh, they recruited me to, um, to work for them as a, an investigator in a store, you know, managing loss prevention, catching shoplifters, those types of things. So now I'm up here, living up here in the mountains, going down there for work every day. The best wage I ever had, life was good. Well, then this, this corporation, I, you know, I think it was a good fit. I, they liked my values. Um, I was excelling and they just promoted me and relocated me and promoted me and relocated me. I ended up all the way in their headquarters in the Midwest. And now by this time I have um, my other children. I have Katrina and Crystal. And so I have Cassandra, Katrina, and Crystal. And man, I was, and I have God. So I got my wife. I've got a way, I remember thinking that if I ever made 40,000 a year in my life, I'd be the man. If I could just get there, I would be awesome. And I got there in six months with this company. And now I've got my, my three little girls that just, melt me and I you know and I'm a, and I'm got a I'm a protect them and I've got my beautiful wife that I got to protect her from you know just everybody looking at her because she's so stunning and uh, so life is just 
just great, great, great. But they, this corporation just kept promoting me, and um, they would they would serve me great compliments. Your strengths are your biggest need. Your sincerity. Uh, you are uh, you're a commodity in the in the plastic palace. Um, just flattering. Just f I just had honestly I had probably some I had world leaders for sure world class leaders that were mentoring me. However, that money and that that stature and that living where you're on a plane three days a week and you're in the corporate chat and you're staying in five star hotels and your per diems are you can have there's not a restaurant um, that we could not eat at and it kind of I wasn't grounded I was again and I you kind of feel yourself moving away from God a little bit again after God you don't realize that God's the one giving you all these blessings you kind of lose sight of that you lose sight of of your family's needs of you in your own mind in your own head your own head traffic you're saying I am a badass for my family. I'm giving them a six-figure salary. Um, I'm getting them the nice clothes and the nice cars. I'm getting them this and that. When, in fact, that means nothing to them or very little. They want you home with them. And I wasn't. I was gone for years. So now I'm a, a, away from church. I didn't have a church up there in Minnesota that I was attending. And I'm getting empty again, and I feel maybe you can call it depression. I don't know what it is, but I'm just away, away, away. I basically didn't get to watch my three daughters hardly grow up at all. So during their in, in, entire, you know, young years and teenage years, I was in the corporate world catching uh, criminals. And um, then my dad got sick. And my dad uh, fell ill, and I thought I would still, I still had 40, 50 years to be with my dad or something. You know, I don't know what I was thinking, but I'm, you know, what, three, 4,000 miles away, and he's out here in the mountains that I want to be in, and I'm out there in flatland country, missing my mountains, and I'm missing my dad, missing my mountains, missing my church, emptiness filling in again, missing God, but... But anyway, I uh, wanted to get back home and I basically resigned that company and it shocked them. And I think it shocked my wife. I didn't partner with her or anything. And uh, they turned it into an FMLA. They, my boss there was phenomenal. He put together a relocation package, relocated my, my wife and all my kids literally to this home we're sitting in right now sent my wife and kids home and they relocated me to Pasadena, California and gave me the whole market down there. We relocate back here. Um, I'm once again happy we find this little church. That was the first thing that we, that we did when we got back here is we have to find a church. And we found Millville Baptist Community Church with Pastor Ryan Hollister up there in a little school, little elementary school gym, about 12 of us in the congregation and they're all up there playing fiddles and strumming guitars and listening to Zach as a little guy play his fiddle was just melting us all and his dad on fire for God and just praying and we're like oh yeah we got to do this and uh, my dad ill but my mom and dad never really knew God they didn't not even really they just didn't know God and with my dad being sick then all of a sudden I'm on fire for God I'm witnessing to my mom and dad but my sister Trisha doing even a better job witnessing to my mom and dad. Basically, she um, found this. I think, I think I found the church with her to find one for my mom and dad. And when the when her and I and my wife walked into this little church, we're like, "Oh, fill it! Can you fill it? Oh yeah, I fill it. Can you fill it? Yeah, I fill it." And you just. You, you just feel it. It's like I call it a secret handshake sometimes, right? When I look at you, when I look at you, Mr. Cameraman, you can see that 
secret handshake. You feel that secret handshake. Like, you know what I'm talking about. You, you know what I'm talking about. And a lot of people, you want to be a part of that little secret handshake. They look at you and it's that peace thing that I'm talking about. I want some of that peace thing. They'll look at us and they'll go, they got a little, they got a little secret handshake or something going on over there. And it's the Holy Spirit. It's the, it's the knowledge that I know you felt the Holy Spirit. And it's the knowledge that I know that it's real, that I felt the Holy Spirit, that you know that God's real, Jesus is real. And you know that he died on the cross for our sins and there is nothing or nobody going to change our mind. Bring on all of whoever wants to knock on my door, criticize me on social media, do whatever, threat me. Bring on all the evil you want to, but I got the shield of the Lord in front of me and I'm going to go unscathed and unfazed. Maybe not unscathed, but I'm not going to change my course. So that's that feeling that we had. Celeste, Trisha, I had that, that secret handshake feeling. And so, hey, mom, dad, will you go to church with us? Got them to start going to church. Then my mom and dad. My mom and dad gave their life to Christ. If I had if I had one thing to say to like non-believers, especially grown men and women that are non-believers, the greatest gift that my dad gave to me and my mom gave to me was dedicating their life to Christ. Because if I am a Christian believer that dedicated my life to Christ, and those of you know who I am talking about, and your parents did not, it's tough to process. How do you process? Or my, you're processing it like, well, I think maybe the last three minutes of their life they dedicated their life to Christ and I'm gonna see him in heaven. I mean, is that really what you want your children to be thinking? Is it? So, <laughs> I don't have to think about it. I know where my mom and dad are. They gave me that gift. God gave them that gift and they gave it to me. Why my dad was sick. My dad, it was a couple strokes he had, two or three over and over. He was able to completely get by his strokes, but he, was, he also was um, now becoming diabetic. And so he was, he, he was type one and he needed insulin. He needed, uh, got to the point where he needed the transfusions or whatever they, dialysis. We'd have to take him into town, um, I think once or twice a week for his dialysis. And then, but I got to hunt with him more. We got to go out, him and I, just him and I, again, I'm back, I'm home. I'm in the mountains. I got the home, little beat up home of my dreams that Celeste and I dreamt about. Something that I prayed about in our headquarters. I was talking to Jeremiah and I was telling Jeremiah that I prayed for this little beater home on my knees crying on a 49th floor in an office in a downtown big city in the Midwest. Never thought about it again because I felt that ah, well, if God wants me to have it, I'll have it. But he, Lord just know I really want it. And I was probably living in the house two years before it hit me where I was just sitting down, kneeling down to pray. God, it was like deja vu. It all hit me. I now remember five years ago praying for that home that I could one day be back with my mom and dad, which they own a home three miles down the road in the mountains hunt and fish with my dad before I lose him. And there's another blessing and miracle, undeserved blessing is what I call him. I don't understand completely how the Lord can, 
can sacrifice and do what he did and give me the gifts and the blessings that I pray for constantly and just keep giving and giving and giving and giving. And I look at these blessings and I go and I get emotional because I'm like, I don't deserve them. I, I just, I don't feel like I do enough. The scale is like this. My dad um, died a year later and I lost him. We lost a son a year later. The best way we call it is kind of SIDS, but but our little guy Christian Hunter was stillborn. And uh, it crushed me. I take ownership for it because, again, I think a lot of people take God for granted. He is a mercy God, a loving God, and all those types of things. But sometimes, you know, I just feel that the good Lord does certain things that kind of wake you up. And we were baby making machines. And there's people out there that can't have babies, that wish they could have babies, that want to adopt, that just would do anything to have a baby. And I can, we pretty much were shown that we could have a baby anytime we want. We just already had five. And it's just like, yeah, she's pregnant, all right good we're gonna have another baby that's cool you know it's like just taking it for granted and I when we lost that baby it was like hey I don't think you understand what a gift this is that's how I took it other Christian strong Christian folks and everything says nah he don't work that way well in my heart um, it hit me that way and then we were told that we could not and should not have any more children because of her uterine walls and this and that. Well, I don't know, nine months later, she gave birth to another baby boy. My dad's name was Ski Mitchell. Our, um, our lost son was Christian Hunter. And so now we had this little boy named Hunter Mitchell, named after um, my dad and the baby. And then my daughter named her son Christian. I just feel like the most blessed individual in the world. I don't know anybody that's been able to live the life that I did. I did transition from the corporate world immediately to the guide world, which I felt, you know, I wanted to hunt and fish anyway and needed to figure out a way to hunt and fish for a living. So I went from six figures to not six figures. I think I told you I at least discovered a way to um, be a millionaire guide. I'm proud of myself for figuring that out, which was to just start out as a billionaire. And um, but I am way richer today, way richer today than I ever was in the corporate, wor corporate world making good six-figure salaries. And I wouldn't change anything for the world. I got my boys are guides, outstanding guides, outstanding morals. Every one of my children have dedicated their lives to Christ. I, I always, I always forget what my daughter said to me one day that that I think explains this very well. It's something to the effect that you know, Kent sees sometimes don't have it all together, but together we have it all, and. Uh, that I, I can't, that's got to be the truest statement about our family. And now it's all coming to fruition where I'm seeing, you know, all these blessings just over and over have just become so overwhelming to me. And uh, so one of the biggest things that I do when I think about it the blessings that I receive from this community 
here even in Oak Run and in Reading from my neighbors, John Henry Simonis and his family, um, Chuck Kinney and his family, you know, the, the gas and propane guys, the blessings that these, these and my clients throw at me, Josh Magnuson, I think of all these guys that just bless me, bless me, bless me. The first thing that I that comes back to my mind is how can I get, what can I do, what, how can I give it back to the community? And my friend, that's where you come in. So I had a one of my children a few years back attempt suicide. And I reached out to you. I don't even know if you remember. It was very subtle. And I was broken. I had pastor support here, several of them. My Christian brothers and everything just praying and just hovering over me and my wife. The good Lord said, not done with you yet, kid. I got, we got, you got much greater work ahead of you to my child. And then that's where it hit me again. There's my message right there. Here is a man that I always aspired to be, and that's you. Here's a man that I have lived vicariously through. Then you even changed a little bit your format to God and trust the guide. I was just seeing little bits and pieces of that starting to show up at your campfires. Then I reach out to you and you respond to me. Because you were given a very, very heartfelt video about Christ and some demons that you were going through and some struggles. And you may have even talked about suicide on the one. I don't know, but it seems like there was some sort of flavor there. And that it hit me. And I'm like, there's the gift that I got to give to my community. Our community is full of hunters and fishermen and outdoorsmen and ranchers. And if I can get this guy that his strength is speaking and inspiring and motivating others through his experiences in hunting and fishing and outdoors and guiding that is preaching about the Lord and giving testimonial, then I'll feel like I have given back. So thank you. Thank you for that. And that's where you come in. And that's why we're here. And then... I think I told you this, but... Charlie, Charlie said, I want to go see the Redwoods. And then three weeks later, you call after we told them, whenever you turn 18, or before, whenever you graduate high school, we'll take you anywhere in the world you want to go. And she said, I want to go see the Redwoods. I'm like, I think we can do that. And then three weeks later, the phone rings. And then I come out here, and then I meet Zach. And then you call me up for this year, and he's like, hey, I'm going to put you in contact with this guy. <laughs> it's all connected. I agree. Yeah. And once you know that secret handshake and you've gotten that secret handshake and when you see these things come together, that's like, why am I stressing and worrying so much and striving so much when if I just be still and let him be God, he'll bring it all together in his timing. Amen. That's... <laughs> That's why I'm here for me. <laughs>
Thank you, brother. I love you, brother. Going back a few years back, um, I was going, I was going through some things personally, um, leaving my high paid job, unhappy, maybe some depression, maybe some mental illness. I don't know what it was. And probably a lot of self pity, no longer the hero, no longer making the six figures, looking for somebody to blame it on and found my wife, perfect person to blame everything on how hard I worked for 25, 30 years already. How ungrateful you are to, you know, not have me on a pedestal anymore as your Superman, you know, coming to the bedroom, chewing ice every night just to irritate me to no end already not giving me any love and attention and then chewing ice just to add a little cherry on top to your disdain for me. And uh, we go to Alaska, We're working in Alaska. We still, my wife will never separate, will never divorce, but we're, and we'll never not sleep in the same bed. We're always in the same bed. We're always next to each other. There might be a dog between us or something that I don't appreciate, but, um, you know, we have those certain commitments that we will never, never give up, but we get to Alaska. She's still just chewing the ice just to irritate the heck out of me. And, uh, I was at, at my wits ends and we get back, we get back from Alaska and we, um, she said she couldn't swallow. She's having trouble swallowing. So we, we, uh, took her to a clinic she might even just drove herself because i was like i yeah she probably just want some attention she goes there and they we get a call back like immediately right when they got blood results i don't know if it was the next day or what it was but it was like she needs to get you need to get celeste to emergency at the main hospital immediately we get down there, she's anemic, her hemoglobin, if I'm saying it right, is below a seven. I'm pretty sure it was, it was like around a six or something, which basically she could she could die. All her organs are shutting down. Couldn't figure it out. Then so they do an emergency blood transfusion and the hospital gave her the the wrong blood. Which then sends her into cardiac arrest. So she has a heart attack. So then um, they do a stint to see the damage on her heart. They said, no, she's got a heart like a 30-year-old. And I'm like skeptically believing, oh, yeah, I'm going to believe you folks. Um, worried about a lawsuit. So, you, you know, you're going to tell me that, you know, her heart's good after what you just did to her and just about killed her. For several more weeks, Celeste battled for her life. Well, actually, for... Later on that day, they said she couldn't get up for a couple hours because they needed her stent to coagulate. So not only did we wait a couple hours, we waited about six hours and then we had little Hunter with us. He was, he was a little young boy at the time at the end of the bed and, uh, Celeste said she needed to go to the bathroom. So I helped her get up. She said she needed help. And as I was helping her up, she was like, I need help. I need help. I need, I need back down to push, push the red button. I need help. Something's, something's happening. Something's not right. And basically her bl bladder released onto the floor and then her stent gave, she was bleeding out and I didn't know she was bleeding out because it, it did a hemo something, basically a blood water balloon was what had happened. And I, I don't know if it burst or what, but basically she ble she was bleeding out. She went code, code blue. We hit the button, nurse comes running in, sees what's going on, jumps on Celeste, throws her knee in, basically saves Celeste's life. And, uh, Chaos everywhere in my little. Uh, 
and my little guy watching it at the end of the bed. And I'm, I'm, I'm the hero. I'm the protectionist. I'm the one that's supposed to protect my wife. But no. If anybody knows anything about anemia, the very first signs of anemia is chewing ice. So for a year, my wife chewed ice to annoy me when in fact she was chewing ice because she was dying. So you know how some people, um, like, I don't know, uh, like when you go to a bridal shower and you know how like, well, you've probably never been to a bridal shower. But anyway, when you go to a bridal shower, there are sometimes they ask, could you, is there any type of advice to give to, you know, the bride, you know, for her husband and blah, 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 blah. And then they give you these little tiny cards about this big. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like looking at it like, whew. And they want me to write on this. And I said, do you got a couple of sheets of paper or something? And they always laugh about it. I said, see me afterwards. So then I talked to them afterwards. And we start talking about, um, about she says, well, you know, how, how do you make a marriage work? She goes, I see you and Brian and stuff. And I said, how can I explain it? I said, oh, in my version, I said, okay, I want to explain it as a roller coaster. You ever been on a roller coaster ride? And of course, you're like, roller coaster ride to get on it and you're all excited, you know, you don't know what to expect, right? You know it's gonna go up and down possibly, whatever. You get on this roller coaster and it takes off. And then all of a sudden it takes off and then you're like, whoa! And then it jerks you this way, it jerks you that way. And then you're And then, but you know what? You're hanging on, right? To me, that's what marriage is. I said, it's like a roller coaster ride because you're gonna have your ups and your downs. I mean, the roller coaster, you're not going to let go and just say, hey, I'm done with it. You're going to hang on. I said, marriage is like that to me. I said, it's work. It's not just all fun and games. Sometimes, like I was explaining to some people, sometimes marriage is 50-50. Sometimes marriage is 70-30. Somebody's got to give a little, somebody take a little. Sometimes it's 80-20, and sometimes it's 99-1. And usually when I say 99-1, people just look at me like, and I said, well, let me give you an example of the 99-1. I said, well, there was a, a year that I got really, really sick and everything like this. And I ended up in the hospital. And um, my husband, you know, I, I helping with my grandkids, this and that and everything like this, and um, ended up having a heart attack, had all kinds of medical issues. But my husband went to work every day. He took care of my kids that were still at home. He took over my spot as feeling as a grandma, you know, picking up grandkids, dropping off grandkids, you know, doing that stuff. Picking them up, dropping them off, and coming back home. And then when they released me from the hospital, my husband brought me home. And he still continued to take care of the kids because I couldn't walk, I couldn't do anything. And this man took care of me took care of my kids, did my chores as a grandma, filling in as grandma, and, and came home, cooked dinner, took me to the bathroom, gave me a bath and everything. And he, that was where I looked at it as 99-1 comes in because he didn't give up on me. And I know his faith was strong. He felt he was doing what he would needed to do. And I was that one person, I couldn't help do nothing, but he was there for me. I know God and my children were all there for him. And so I said, that's why I say, sometimes marriage, it's work. And to me, it's like a roller coaster ride because I love roller coasters. But that's what I feel like marriage is to me. And that's how I can only explain it. <laughs> She's going anemic. And in my little self pity party and selfishness, Maybe, maybe a little too much info. My wife's probably okay with it. I know she's okay with it, and I know I'm with it if you decide to, to allow it, is that when they're completely anemic like that and down to a seven, 
they pretty much are dehydrated and have no fluid, which makes them not interested in you as a man and a wife. And everything was being caused by anemia, and I'm thinking everything is caused because I changed careers and not making as much money anymore. But none of that, none of that was true. And as they were fighting for her life, they couldn't find the clamp that's, that they needed on the floor that we were on to stop the bleeding. And so we're waiting and waiting and it was just a mess. And then they finally got a clamp and they, gosh, it seemed like an hour, finally got her uh, stabilized and alive. She was out, she was unconscious. I thought she was dead. After we got her stabilized, I, and we knew she was going to make it. I hit a camera. I hit a camera in the corner. My family picked a, a song, like a theme song for my wife and I by Alan Jackson. And so with this camera, I, I, I got my wife out of bed. She can't walk. My wife loves to dance. I can't stand it. So I held my wife up and put the music on and danced with her. As a memory for my children. That was the one time in my life I enjoyed dancing. Oh, I love my family. I love my kids. Uh, you know how like people say that they want to leave a, a legacy or you know that type of thing. And I think with my children, I think I've even, as a Christian, have learned so much from my children. You know, um, I've always wanted them to be close to God. And you know how like people will pray that, you know, you pray for your children, that they stay safe and that they're saved and everything like that. And God answers prayers. It's not on our time. It's on His time. And so there are so many things that have happened that my children are are just i mean my husband my children are my world and i know that someday i mean i could have died twice and there's a reason god has not taken me <laughs> i guess my job on this earth is not done but someday when it is my time to go i am proud to know that my children someday i will see them all and i'll see my husband and i hope that my children continue spread the word of God and love one another and be there for one another like they are. Yeah, they have their ups and downs, their siblings. <laughs> but, you know, that's one thing we have taught our children. Family, God, that's all you need. And have compassion and love for others. And I hope they continue to spread that word. And I'm just most proud of them for that. Love it. <laughs> so Celeste talks about how she likes roller coasters. Brian and I like the mountains. And Brian and I also have something else in common that we are both way too white to dance. <laughs> so the same way Celeste sees marriage being like a roller coaster, I kind of see life as the ultimate mountain hunting adventure. 
it's hard, nothing is guaranteed. In fact, I think it's set up so that you know going into it that you're not gonna get it right every time. And between every mountain peak is a valley. Life is easy when you're on the mountain tops, but it's in the valleys where you find out what's real or what's fake, what works and what doesn't. You find out who's for you and who's against you, what's worth listening to and what's just noise. And in the deepest, darkest, most desperate valleys when we're totally lost, eventually we're forced to be honest with ourselves. And that's where we find out who we are and whose we are. And that's where and when we come to that point of surrender that we find and we receive the secret handshake. Seeing that, man, I don't think anybody could watch that <laughs> and not cry, <laughs> especially knowing the story. Yeah. And uh, your vulnerability of uh, the anemia thing, because every, every man and every wife, every person in every relationship can relate to that. Yeah. They're going to be convicted by that. I was convicted by that. Yeah, we didn't come. I'm sure you're a damn good turkey guy, but we didn't come here to go turkey hunting. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad. I'm so glad that we did, that we just took today off and had that conversation there mm -hmm. for that to come out. Because yeah. that's what this world needs. It doesn't need another turkey getting his head blasted off, you know. Uh, yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Not as bad as it needs that. Yeah. It helps with the noise. Because <laughs> I've had cameramen with me before. And if I had my way, and you don't want to put this on film, I would rather <laughs> yeah, <we do>. bury <laughs> them in the woods a few times. Yeah. Or maybe just cut them and hunt off them next week. <laughs> Life insurance policy. And when you, when you bust your butt so hard. Can I get a hoi? Yeah. And I'm sitting there, I'm sound asleep. And I'm just like. I'm on my recline in the front room, and I'm like, Celeste, and I just said, yeah, baby, what the hell is that smell? And she, I hear her spitting her food and laughing, you know, she starts doing that. Oh, my God. 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 Oh, my God
hell? You, I, I, I thought maybe she farted. Like, what the hell? And she's like, it was your friend. I don't know which one, but it was your friend. Get out of there. Like, <laughs> I get woken up by sound all the time. I have never been woken up by the snow. Did you hear what Jeremiah said? He's like, and then I get the air pressure and it's just spray before. <laughs> He's like, I used half the bottle anyway. <laughs> want a good Christmas present for your mom is you get her a blower in that bathroom. <laughs> but I'll be eating figs and drinking gallons of water. <laughs> the first thing I told your dad is like, Jeremiah owns your bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get your name up there somewhere. <laughs> Jeremiah, Jeremiah was here. <laughs> For information on other DVDs, books, and modern-day mountain man apparel, log on to BillyMullsAdventures.com. Here you'll also find information on Alaskan hunting opportunities with Billy for doll sheep, caribou, moose, brown bear, grizzly bear, as well as white-tailed deer hunting in Wisconsin. When he's not guiding, Billy travels across the country as a public speaker. His experience, knowledge, and passion for nature, along with his unmatched ability to relate his wilderness adventures to any audience, are the cornerstones of his dynamic, one-of-a-kind presentations. A master storyteller, Billy presents at corporate events, schools, universities, conservation organizations, wild game dinners, Christian outreaches, and much more. Just like the Alaskan wilderness, no one leaves a Billy Moles presentation the same person as they enter it. Log on or call for more information. <laughs>